Welcome back to my coverage of the Zurich International Chess Tournament of 1953. We are on to round number three, and the way this works is I pick the most interesting games of every round, and we go through them. For this round, there were two games that there were some surprising blunders in, because typically the way that these games work is there's a series of inaccuracies, and that is what decides the game. But here there were some simple moves that were just singular blunders, which is quite rare at this level, so I wanted to go through them. There are two games in specific. We're starting with game number 18, which is Zabo against Karis. Let's jump into it. So game number 18, Zabo has the white pieces, Karis with the black ones. We have d4, d5, knight f3, knight f6, and now c4. Pawn takes on c4, knight c3, a6, and already here on move 5 came a super early mistake, a super early blunder. And the move, of, the move a6, of course, makes black's intentions extra clear. Black wants to play b5 at the right moment, support this pawn here, making it impossible uh, to win back the material, develop the bishop, um, and of course this would leave black in a pretty pleasant position. And so a huge mistake was played here, queen a4 check, which basically begs for b5 to be played, and... Perhaps white banked on some tactical ideas here, like knight takes b5 using this pin, but I mean, at such a high level, you have to see the continuation bishop d7, which, well, creates a pin uh, right back at white, and I mean, you can take the pawn here, or maybe better is knight takes here check, and then saving your queen, but in the end, you're down a ton of material, black has super nice development with the knight coming out, the bishop eventually as well in castles, black is in no danger at all, and, and you're, you're just in a much worse position. And actually, Bronstein wrote something kind of clever um, about this move, queen a4. He said that, you know, although the game continued for dozens of more moves, the second queen a4 was played, the game was basically over because not only on the board do you have a, a horrible position, but also psychologically, you make this mistake and, you know, everything starts to go downhill. You, you assume that you have to play super aggressively. You have to just launch your pawns in the center to get some sort of counterattack to make this pawn sacrifice and this time sacrifice justified. And by doing so, you actually just make your position worse and worse and worse. And this is exactly what happened from here. It just went downhill um, again and again. And, you know, not defending the pawn here is fine because, you know, taking here could be a little risky because, you know, you don't have the developments yet. So e6 was played here, looking to be able to develop quickly in castle. But now black can easily take the pawn with no fear of the king being stuck in the center. So something like bishop e3 is pretty important here just to defend the pawn. And it would leave white with an okay game. I mean, it's still very bad and black would probably win, but it would give white some middle game chances. But here white continued to blunder, uh, making his one move mistake carry out throughout the entire game. Bishop g5 giving away the pawn. And now because the bishop can develop quickly, black is okay with simply taking. Uh, the knight took, queen took, and... Sure, you attack the queen, and sure, you can attack it again. Um, and, and maybe you can develop kind of nicely, especially with this coming to aim at the queen again. But even if you get some time to develop, the end result after you castle and they simply develop their bishop, you're down a pawn. Their position is super solid. Usually if you are down a pawn, then you have some sort of compensation, uh, even if you don't necessarily realize it. But here, there's, there's absolutely nothing. You know, black has really nice development. The center is pretty much equal. You know, the, the bishops can trade. This structure is super solid, and the king can castle next move. So what's the issue here for black? There is none. And uh, that's exactly what happened. White tried to press, and again, g4. This is kind of uh, what I was talking about. If you make a mistake, you understand that you're doing really badly. You try to complicate things, and that's overall a good strategy, but you don't want to go too crazy with it because you end up just giving more and more free material and making the game end even more quickly. Uh, and then that's exactly what happened here. You know, now we traded queens and there's, there's nothing here. Uh, the game continued for some time. White continued to try to complicate things. And uh, admittedly, white did get some nice chances. You know, there's uh, indeed some threats in some of these positions. Like here, you know, perhaps taking and then using this pin uh, would have been possible. But you know, you, you, as black, you're, you're so, so happy here. You have extra material, a passed pawn. As long as you watch out for these really 
small, basic, one-move threat, you're going to be totally fine. And that's exactly what Karras did here. Played this endgame perfectly, um, and in the end managed to promote uh, a pawn in the next couple of moves. So White simply resigned here because there's no point. So the game, as uh, Bronstein noted, did indeed end with this one huge mistake in the opening. And I thought this was a, a, an interesting game of, of this round, one of the most interesting ones of the round, because you you know this is such a basic mistake, uh, but it, it reassures you that everyone can make it. And also to keep on calculating deeply, right? After you go here, you take, and some people stop their calculations noticing the pin. But always ask one more move to the opponent. Ooh, they can play bishop here, pinning you, and then it's actually you that is losing. Um, and then the second instructive idea, even if you're down here, uh, you know, try to complicate matters, but to a certain extent, to a certain limit, still stay solid. Um, and, you know, because by giving more material to your opponent, you're simply making their win much, much more easy. So that was game 18. And one game later, Irve against Smyslov, game 19, there was another mistake. Now this one, um, you know, is a little bit more understandable, uh, but it is still a one move mistake nonetheless. And it actually took a pretty decent position and turned it into completely losing in just one move. So let's go through this. Now the opening we see, of course, this C4, D4 combo as we've always seen, and we get some interesting Grunfeld structure um, with white controlling the center and black looking to attack uh, in a more modern way with the bishop, for example, on G7, uh, sniping down in the center. And this is exactly what happened, C5, D5 to lock up the structure, and now E6, castles, uh, we have castles, and now a4, gaining more space, trying to, in some cases, push a5. We have knight a6, we have knight to a3, uh, which is kind of funny, the symmetry with knight a6 and knight a3, both considered typically not great moves, but here, super understandable because both have some pretty nice squares that they could in the future jump to. We have trades in the center, and now bishop to f5. And this bishop is a, is a very powerful piece because... Typically, the queen wants to come to c2, uh, so just having the bishop here controlling the light squares uh, is, is a very good strategy, especially when this bishop can't really trade this one because this one has a very important role on a second diagonal. So now we have knight to c3, both knights perhaps looking uh, to start making advancements on the queen side, knight to b4, bishop to e3, and now there was a, a very instructive moment d6 was played here, which I think is a really lovely move because, well, okay, you're pushing your pawn, advancing it, and, you know, past pawns need to be pushed, as the saying goes. But more importantly, I think you're opening up your bishop, a, a bishop that was previously pretty useless. Even though it's a nice defender, it's not doing anything aggressive. But after d6, suddenly, it's a pretty key piece, and you can see that this bishop is indeed going to become a very key piece for white here. Now... You might be wondering, isn't this pawn a little bit uh, in danger of being captured in some way? And there are cases where this pawn could be captured. Uh, in fact, here, black plays a very nice move, bishop d3, trying to cut the support for the queen. And, you know, maybe you can argue that there's some ways to defend this pawn still uh, in some certain cases. But even the truth is, even if you lose this pawn, the fact that you open up your bishop, I think, is, is justified. Uh, for giving away a pawn because you're also going to win back one and your bishop is going to be super powerful for the rest of the game. So this kind of trade-off between material and piece activity is a very interesting one here. Now bishop d3 also obviously poses a threat on the rook. And rather than trying to move the rook or save the material, white does a great move here. Bishop takes on b7, giving uh, an exchange, um, but by doing so, maintaining a two-bishop advantage, and it should be noted these bishops are doing a lot right now. The knights are also super powerful. This pawn, you know, as I said, it can be definitely a weakness, but also a massive strength. I mean, imagine it gets to, to d7, your rook uh, can, can come to the back rank in some way. There could be some issues here for black. Um, and overall, it's not that much material. So this was a, a totally justified, um, a totally justified exchange sack. Now, knight d7 here, uh, blockading the pawn, and this is a, a, a common strategy that we've seen in past games in this tournament. You don't want the pawn to advance for the reason that I just said. Maybe the rook can try to squeeze to the back rank in some way and cause some trouble, especially 
with the bishops that are, are going to be able to control these squares here, that could lead to some trouble. So knight to d7, a very safe, solid idea. Now knight to c4, knight e5, we have the, the pieces being traded off, and bishop takes on c5. Queen to a5, attacking the bishop. Bishop to e3. We have rook to d8. And now centralizing the knight, knight to e4. Very nice. Bishop takes d6. And here you can kind of see the bishop has been dragged away from this diagonal. The second that happens, no matter if the bishop took a pawn or a piece or just moved for some random reason, it's going to lead to at least some uncomfortable positions for black because this bishop is a key defender um, when it comes to these dark squares. And so already here, knight to f6 check, and uh, it's becoming a little uncomfortable, and, and you'll see this. So the king moved to h8, trying to hide in the corner of the board, but now bishop d4, beautiful move. Again, with the bishop not being on this diagonal, white can try to take control of all these dark squares, which is precisely why black immediately put the bishop right back on this diagonal. And it seems here like the attack, if there was any, fizzles out completely. Uh, but that is not the case. And here there is a brilliant move, super difficult to find because, you know, you're calculating what if you take and then maybe try to give some checks or uh, perhaps you move the queen maybe or try to get the queen involved into the attack somehow. But all these moves are just going to leave uh, black with a ton of extra material, right? Even though these pieces are nice attacking the king, they're super flimsy. So you have to be really careful. And there's only one good move here uh, that keeps an attack going. And it's a really hard, difficult move, knight d7. And you're blocking the rook's connection uh, along this d-file, which is critical. And you're prepared to take back with the queen and launch some nasty attacks. And we can look at some lines. So in this game, f6 was played, but why not some other moves? Well, if queen a6 check, first of all, uh, well, I guess we'll go through this last because it's, it's better to go through the most basic lines first. So bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, king g8, knight back here, check. Uh, and now something like king to h8, notice coming here um, would run into you know, certain ideas of checkmate, perhaps the rook can slide in and cut the king. On, on h8, even though it runs into this pin, because the queen is attacked, it seems safer. Um, but here we can go knight d5 anyways, and then we can go knight e7, and then check the king and bring the rook in, and white has a pleasant game here with this really unsafe king. Notice not only a queen and uh, a rook attacking, but a very critical bishop as well, something you should not forget slicing all these light squares, which could definitely come into play in this attack. So that would have been one line if black chose to trade in the center. And if rook takes d7, seems decent, you're slightly pinning. Well, pins work both ways, and bishop takes, queen takes, and queen takes d7. Now the rook was undefended, that is the critical idea. And, I mean, white is totally fine here. Something like queen takes b2, um, even rook e1, saving the rook, and Black has a lot of weaknesses in their camp. The rook can potentially slide in. This is a totally fine game for white. So for this reason, after this move, knight to d7, f6 was played. Uh, oh, and queen a a6, I'll, I'll also mention, doesn't really change much. For example, takes, takes, and f6 now. Well, you can even go knight takes uh, rook. The queen on a6, even though it gave a check, it's now vulnerable to the knight attacking it and knight takes b8 would leave uh, white in a super pleasant position. Something like this is, is great. Materially, when we're looking at the pieces, it's equal, but of course, this pawn here is a dangerous pawn for white, and with this extra material on the board, white does have chance to trade down um, or use this material to support some pawn pushes. So that was kind of the line with queen a6. So now that we've exhausted really all alternatives for black, uh, the right approach we should talk about, which is f6. This is a, a very genius idea. Basically just cutting the connection between the bishop and, and king, which is the key attacking idea that white has here. This weakness on these dark squares is where white gets all of its momentum from, so cutting it makes total sense here. Now, the game continued. Bishop takes, pawn takes, and now was the big blunder. And 
You know, chess is brutal in the way where one move here totally wins and white has a crushing attack and one move gives black an edge. Um, and unfortunately, white did not find the correct approach here. They played queen d2, and we'll touch on this move in a second. But the right approach really relates to the central area of the board, um, you know, kind of this area. Specifically, this is the center, but in this case, we can enlarge it a little bit. Because the queen here, if it gets to the center, then from the center, it will be able to to attack much more successfully than a passive square like d2. So what was the right approach? Well, it was actually queen d6, and you put the queen in a super powerful square with all of these moves. So something like rook to b6, now queen e7 is powerful. If the rook moves, you can take the, the rook because previously there was a pin, not anymore. And if knight to c6, a little tricky, defending and attacking, well now check and bishop h3 is uh, most accurate, simply going straight for the king. Now, this was not played. And why does queen d2 not work? Well, it works, it doesn't work for the same reason that queen d6 was so powerful. Black can just take control of the center, and when you take control of the center, you control the game. So here, queen a6 check, and swinging the queen to e6 would have been basically game over. The knight is in a horrible position uh, because of this pin. It's very tough here. However, black blundered a little bit, not blundered, but a small inaccuracy, and played rook b to c8, and now this allows this really sneaky move, bishop h3. It, previously, the queen supported the square, but now bishop h3 is powerful. It defends the knight, making any ideas of winning the knight basically uh, gone, and this is just a, a good, good position. But instead, uh, here king g1 was played, tucking the king away, stopping all these checks. It's understandable. But unfortunately now black has a nice edge and black simply can convert queen to c5 actually very nice touch using this pin um bishop h3 was played now but it's already a little too late because the queen is more centralized than it was before and queen to e7 for example um, and there was a huge shuffle of pieces here a nice exchange uh here giving the rook for the two pieces and even though black loses a pawn here and the king seems unsafe Black concretely calculated this and realized that, nope, everything is fine, everything is under control. The strategy here is just going to be to maneuver the knight in some way over to the king side, not let these pawns run down the board, and maybe even give checkmate or better, or, or more easy is to just trade material. And this is the strategy that we see being implemented here. Many offers of trades, as you see, over and over again, and ultimately, uh, instead of repeating, of course, you want to move your knight in, um, which black does start to do here. Now, there was one last interesting moment in this endgame. So in the game, rook d5 was played. Rook f4 was an interesting try using the pin, of course. But after queen to e5, rook takes f6, queen takes queen. There is this rook g6 uh, sacrifice, desperado, if you will. But after king takes pawn takes, even though you won a pawn, the knight's way too powerful. Um, it's too activated, it's going to win this pawn and then this pawn and then promote. So that would not have saved white here. Although maybe practically would have been the best chance. But rook d5, queen to e6, it's, it's game over. And after uh, a few more moves, I mean this endgame is a little dry. Black just eventually manages to support the knight coming in. Um, and after few more moves, the game uh, is decided because white resigns here. So I just found those two blunders quite interesting. Hopefully you enjoyed this round three recap. If you haven't watched round one or two, then links will be in the description. Subscribe if you're new around here, and I will see you next time. Peace out.